I, I, and I am very sure that the people who banned the Office of the Chief Justice, the people who banned Parliament, are not the peaceful protesters. These are criminals. What you're hearing is Kenyan President William Ruto speaking via Twitter spaces. 2024, am I right? This event has been hailed by some as a landmark moment in the East African nation's democracy, a moment wherein its leader engages in dialogue directly with its people during a time of crisis. But this view is challenged by important context. Said crisis is the fault of Ruto and Kenya's political establishment, and said dialogue is occurring on their terms coordinated by those sympathetic to his regime. This proves convenient for them given the dialogue of the streets which they are patently unable to control. Since the 18th of June, protests ostensibly led by young adults and teens have brought international attention to Kenya's social, political, and economic crises. Originating in response to the Kenya Finance Bill 2024, a movement of online and offline activism quickly became a movement of rioting against the established political order, demanding in particular that President Ruto resign his post. Hearing this might make you wonder, what did the finance bill do to make them that mad? And that's a valid question, but as you might expect, the problem really goes far beyond the finance bill. The problem is how a young nation, emergent after decades of brutal colonial rule, continues to struggle against the corrupting forces of capital inside and out. This is Kenya. Folks, let's start from the present and work our way back. On the 7th of July, hundreds of Nairobians gathered for a concert held to commemorate victims of the Kenyan government's protest response. The number of those dead is hard to measure. Example is that of David Chege, shot in the head by police. He was a Sunday school teacher. His body lay dead in the street, treated like litter. As protesters came to him, honoring him by covering his head and displaying the Kenyan flag over him, they were shot at too. Meanwhile, reports and word of mouth abound of demonstrators being illegally abducted, harassed, tortured, and even killed by the government. This has been the state of affairs since the first death of a protester, a 29-year-old named Rex Masai. His death triggered the movement of seven days of rage, planning more voracious protests in solidarity with the fallen. President Ruto in this moment chose to escalate. In a familiar move for political leaders prepping violent suppression of protest, he suggested the movement had been hijacked by dangerous people. The thing about that is, these accusations contradict overwhelming eyewitness accounts of police killing peaceful protesters. And of course, they did nothing to calm protests. Peaceful demonstration met with police violence will turn into rioting, which becomes a mix of self-defense tactics and opportunism. And of course, said opportunists often are directly trying to contradict the purpose of the protests. Fear-mongering over looting in the riots has been quelled by footage revealing that, in at least one instance, the people looting, because there were people looting, were the police themselves. May it be on record that it is the police who are destroying people's property, not us. Why? Like we've seen around the world, the widespread availability of social media and digital recordings has been a tool for the people to grow stronger in their fight despite the odds. Objectively cool shots of Kenyan protesters smoking tear gas have proliferated across the world. And without doubt, this combination of online and offline resistance, highlighted by demonstrators storming the parliament building on June 25th, led to Ruto's administration eventually rejecting the finance bill 2024 on June 26th. And of course, this is the bill that sparked the original resistance. Listening keenly to the people of Kenya who have said loudly that they want nothing to do with this finance bill 2024, I concede. What I want to get across though is that the finance bill is not really the beginning here. And some attempts in the media to merely construe these protesters as anti-taxed undermines the totality of their political struggle. In reality, the finance bill was the straw that broke the Geranuk's brown saddled back. Yes, I will be making references to Kenyan wildlife from time to time. Around this time last year, a similar finance bill was met with similar response, protest, which in turn was then quelled violently, leading to six deaths. You see a pattern? Both bills reflect an ongoing theme in Kenya and around the developing world. 
an overwhelming need to pay off international debt, and an entrenchment of wealthy elites in the political establishment leading to continuous draining of working class income, rendering cost of living exceedingly high. And Kenyans are taking to the streets because they kind of start to feel like the ballot box isn't really working in terms of actually changing their country. Let's spill some tea. Kenyan tea. Did you know Kenya produces a lot of tea? President William Ruto marketed himself as Kenya's savior. With a big voice and ambitious energy, the former vice president and longtime savvy politician promised, among many things, to create affordable housing and remedy citizens' financial burdens. The results have not been promising. Prices of commodities like wheat have continued to soar due to factors like the Russia-Ukraine war. Disruptions in global supply chains have caused the costs of imported goods to rise around the world, especially since the beginning of the pandemic. By the way, speaking of that pandemic, what's going on, y'all? We're, 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 we're not wearing masks? Is that what we're... As a general rule, Kenya's government has not adequately adjusted or guided its civilians in the face of these international pressures. Domestic policies have been doomed to underachieve at best. Ruto's housing fund asked average Kenyans already struggling with money in the face of these economic changes to pay significantly more in taxes just to construct housing that would likely still not be affordable for the vast majority of its citizens including workers in the capital, Nairobi. These workers were Ruto's bread and butter in terms of getting elected. A longtime politician whose background includes involvement in controversial campaigns, let's say for former president Daniel Arap Moy, as well as numerous fallouts and reconnections with elites throughout the past, let's say, decade, Ruto rallied the working class by appealing to his origins as a chicken seller in boyhood. This is a big thing for Ruto. I sold chickens. Elites like Jomo Kenyatta's son and then President Uhuru Kenyatta, who Ruto ran with as vice president before essentially being ousted for working to usurp him, were molded from birth to be in positions of power. They were privileged. Ruto was not. Ruto claimed kinship with the Bodaboras, or motorbike taxi drivers of the city, who were born with no such silver spoon. Ruto glorified the working class as hustlers. He was president hustler, and under his presidency, Kenya would shine as a hustler nation. Imagine Gary Vee as president. A hustler nation deserves its own hustler fund. A standout among Ruto's campaign promises, the hustler fund promised to be an easily accessible, digitally based program with which Kenyans could take out loans in order to pay for their projects. As you know, loans tend to solve everything you deal with financially. Upon launch, the digital interface was buggy, shall we say, and users would struggle to get a loan limit higher than 800 Kenyan shillings. That's about $6 USD. Hardly enough to start your sprawling new business. By the end of the year, the Hustler Fund had already faced significant budget cuts, and the self-made workers it promised to help were often underwhelmed by its positive impacts. And recent audits have raised concerns about numerous bugs and loopholes, like people who shouldn't qualify getting loans, and people who should not getting loans. All of this becomes moot as a working class Kenyan if cost of living continues to increase anyway. Kenyan citizens want to be able to afford necessary items, housing, education. To be told they simply must tap into their hustler nature by accruing debt is an insult and only worsens an environment wherein civilians are incentivized to scam each other to get ahead. But we'll save the capitalism conversation for later on. The great irony of hustling is that it usually means someone else is getting hustled. In June of 2022, Ruto protested then-President Uhuru's finance bill, vastly unpopular due to its heavy taxation of the working classes. Sound familiar? Atop an SUV, he proclaimed in Swahili, Nini munajua budget imesomwa juzi. Hiyo budget inataka kuongeza bei ya maji. Sijui yongeze bei ya mkate. Sijui yongeze bei ya unga. Sijui yongeze bei ya nduthi. Sisi tunataka kuambia hiyo budget Haiwezi kupita kwa bunge na ikipita kwa bunge miezi mitatu baadaye tutaibadilisha iwe ni budget ya mwananchi wa kawaida Politicians are funny man <laughs> It would seem from how drastically Ruto has flipped from an anti overtaxation champion of the working class to killing young working class people protesting his overtaxation that the man was ill-prepared for office, that he simply underestimated the depth of Kenya's financial burdens, that he misunderstood the external forces at play. But that would be naive, because the guy's been in politics for like 20 years, he was the vice president before, and 
Frankly, that means that William Ruto was there when Kenya dug itself into this hole. Besides all that, if you need help managing big funds, there's plenty of tools you can use to help you do that, including rocket money. I'm saving up money because I'm trying to move out. I'm trying to afford things that I enjoy, you know, the usual. And today's sponsor, Rocket Money, is a big help in doing that. Rocket Money is the personal finance app that helps you cancel subscriptions, lower bills, and manage your money better. I've had to think for a while about which subscriptions I want to keep up because there's a lot of subscriptions that you need in today's landscape, let's say. And Rocket Money not only helps me look at what those subscriptions are, because sometimes one forgets, but also helps me go through the process of canceling them, often being able to do it themselves. If you're interested in saving money and spending less on stuff you don't need, consider Rocket Money. Head to rocketmoney.com slash Elliot Sang, that's E-L-L-I-O-T-S-A-N-G, or use the link in the description to get started for free. Thanks to Rocket Money for sponsoring this video, and let's get back to it. As Ruto's administration finally gave up on the finance bill, a familiar opposition voice stepped up to challenge him in the political establishments, to potentially represent the voice of the people dissenting. His name is Raila Odinga, and said Kenyan dissenters don't really want his leadership. The opposition presidential candidate in 2022, Odinga, kind of like William Ruto, is the consummate career politician. But rather than work within, Odinga tends to work without. The son of Jaramogi Oginga Odinga, former vice president of Kenya under Jomo Kenyatta, Raila's memo has long been to market himself as an anti-establishment establishment figure. From an article from Debunk Media, which has been a huge help in making this video. In his political calculations, it is as if Odinga always wants to come from behind, as if turning tables on his opponents offers a better thrill and allows him to plot and move in silence. Odinga is an interesting character. To summarize his history briefly, Raila Odinga was sent by his father, a progressive and founding father of Kenya, to study in Germany at 17. Upon his return eight years later, insert Donald Glover community meme. A lot was happening. Kenya had become a new independent nation, but his father had officially become a pariah to the political establishment upon resigning his vice president post after two years, citing irreconcilable differences, then formed an opposition party, the Kenya People's Union. Now, I'm not going to get too much into tribes and tribal differences and all of that in this video because I'm not super privy to that, as you can tell. But you should know that while the president Jomo Kenyatta was Kikuyu, representing a sort of majority in Kenya. Jaramogi Oginga Odinga and his son Raila Odinga were Luo. That is another fairly well-represented ethnic tribe. A significant Luo political leader and head of the Kenyan economy, Tom Boya, had been assassinated one year prior when Raila was coming back, as had one of Jaramogi's confidants. In October, a Luo crowd feeling threatened and agitated by Kenyatta's speech in Kisumu began to riot, leading to a massacre by the National Guard and police, which killed at least 11 people. Raila Odinga thus returned to an environment in which his tribe had become politicized as rebellious, in which his father's fortunes and reputation had dwindled. Odinga's task was an urgent one bring some kind of stability to his financial life and to his country's politics. This was compounded when he was detained in 1982 by hardman President Moy. Remember him from the Ruto background? Kenyatta's right-hand man and successor, alongside his father, both political rivals of the Moy Kenyatta legacy. Raila was charged with treason, Chadamogi placed on house arrest. Six years later, Odinga was released and then rearrested by Moy and fled the country a year later on threat of assassination, leaving through Uganda dressed as a Catholic nun. This is a wild story. Chadamogi's designated group of successors, including Lupita Nyong'o's dad, by the way, uh, that's just something I'll throw in there, nicknamed the Young Turks, became politically influential in the early 90s and leading activist opposition against Moy, but eventually became subject to its own splintering. This is how politics works. A group starts, it does a thing, then it splinters after a little while. You see the pattern. Odinga would leave after not being elected for leadership and became a more or less independent political force, popular for his background as a political prisoner, a legacy child of liberation struggle, and a leader of the Lowell people. 
He built power for himself when others would not fall in line with his vision, and he knew how to leverage it to eventually push them in his direction. This is just what he did when he backed former political rival Mwai Kibaki in 2002, essentially campaigning in his place after Kibaki was condemned to a wheelchair following a car accident. Then Kibaki failed to give Odinga sufficient power in exchange, as they had agreed, and so Odinga raised the fuss, Kibaki kicked him out, and then Odinga led a massive anti-Kibaki charge, eventually running against him and nearly winning in a controversial 2007 election. By controversial, I do mean this was a contested result that led to something of a civil war in Kenya, which required UN Secretary General Kofi Annan to eventually mediate. Kibaki and Odinga would make peace only after thousands of Kenyans were killed and hundreds of thousands were displaced. Odinga was made prime minister, a position that was basically made up to show he and Kibaki shared power. This was much like Odinga's role in Kibaki's 2002 election, supposed to lead to his election. And then Odinga's party went up in flames, and Jomo Kenyatta's son Uhuru ran for president and beat him in 2013, armed with hotshot Vice President William Ruto. Raila had lost to the son of his dad's op and couldn't even contest the election as successfully as he had years prior, which caused the civil war, of course. This is when Raila Odinga walked away from Kenyan politics, accepting his role as a controversial but important opposition figure, and just kidding, in 2017 he boycotted the re-election of Uhuru Kenyatta and declared himself the actual president of Kenya. One would think this is a completely bizarre move, the sad last gasp of a man who could not accept defeat, who simply would not concede that political power was eluding him. But Raila Odinga knew. He understood Kenyan politics. He knew that behind the scenes, Uhuru Kenyatta and William Ruto had been beefing, and he understood that his large following would pressure this rifting presidency to recognize Odinga as president instead. He saw the opposition, and he jumped in to be a leader in it. What was the result? In 2018, 53 years after splitting up and leaving the nation in chaos, Kenyatta and Odinga reunited. Uhuru and Raila, sons of Jomo and Jaramogo, swore not to make the mistakes of their fathers, and tried to push through legislature a bill that would greatly expand the power of the executive branch and once again create the position of prime minister for Odinga to occupy. Odinga had gone from the president's sworn victim to his bestie. This was likely an overstep. Ruto, taking a page from Raila's book, took advantage of being ousted from establishment and rallied the working classes of Kenya, the older working classes anyway, as well as his Kalenjin tribe, to vote for him as president in 2022 against Odinga, who had put himself in position to finally be successor to the presidency again. And Ruto won. Raila lost again. And to no one's surprise, this was far from his siren song. He would simply wait for popular dissent to mount against the Kenyan president once again, then utilize his iconic status and base to become the face of such dissent. This plan has worked all these times before, why not try it again? The answer is that geopolitics have changed. Societies have changed. Allying with U.S. interests, as the Kenyatta Moi Kenyatta legacy has done for decades, is no longer satisfactory to retain power. And the Kenyan people have seen this movie one too many times. Politicians going from friends to enemies to friends to enemies to friends over and over again for the sake of personal gain. However, it wouldn't be right to just close an examination of Kenyan politics this way. African politics corrupt is a lazy assessment at this period of time. We owe them better in the West. We at least owe ourselves a study of history to understand why such corruption becomes the state of affairs in young nations like these. And so we must discuss colonialism. Yay. The Mau Mau Uprising, which took place between 1952 and 1956 officially, remains controversial even among Kenyans to this day. A violent inter-tribal rebellion against British colonial authorities, Mau Mau was key in pushing Britain to allow Kenyan independence, but it received pushback from Kenyans more connected to the establishment at the time, with noted leader Deran Kimati regarded a terrorist by Jomo Kenyatta and Daniel Arap Moi, the first two presidents of Kenya. It was only in the early 2000s when Mwai Kibaki finally decided to honor him and erect a statue of his visage in tribute. Jomo Kenyatta himself was arrested on suspicion that he was the leader of the Mau Mau, but his actions ruling Kenya after independence belied this consideration. He jailed many Mau Mau who continued to fight for land rights, which had not been properly given to the underclasses. 
a 2022 Jacobin piece by Jacqueline Ashley, interviewed numerous freedom fighters who felt that their efforts were in vain. One said, The government uses the word Mau Mau to serve its own interests. Another, Our enemy is no longer the British. Our enemies are these rich Kenyans who benefited from their rule and then stole our land. But our lands will one day be returned to us, no matter how much time passes because Ngai is on the side of the Mau Mau. As described in Wunyabari Maloba's seminal book Mau Mau and Kenya, prior to Mau Mau, several attempts were made by Kenyans to overthrow colonial rule. Beginning in the late 19th century, the British Empire did British Empire things, expanding into East Africa and increasingly enforcing apartheid, overturning previously established land systems in order to create a protectorate in which land and labor were exploited for British gain. High Commissioner Charles Elliott described the need to make it a white man's country. That's what happens when you spell Elliot with one L instead of two. They established laws that made it legal for white settlers to be given land as the crown saw fit, condemning natives to preordained reserves which would constantly shrink, creating high population areas with little to no resources. Urban centers were created primarily for the use of whites. As Maloba writes, the institution of racism in the colony made it imperative for the development plans of urban centers in Kenya to proceed along racial lines. Residential estates were strictly along color lines, with whites occupying the best parts of the towns. Commercial centers that catered to whites were generally well-planned, and so were their residential estates. Government workers recruited from overseas and even locally were generally provided with superior, comfortable accommodation and servants. The Asians lived in separate areas, usually more crowded than those occupied by whites. In the initial years, it was generally held that urban areas were not for Africans. More and more Africans in the area were forced to turn to terribly underpaid labor. With the highest paid African earning less than half of the annual total emoluments received by the lowest paid Asian worker. Similar to what Kenyans face now, Kenya under British rule was subjugated by overtaxation of the working class and poor, inflation and rise of cost of living, and violent state-led repression of underclass rebellion. The Kenya Land and Freedom Army, which led the Mau Mau uprising, represented a people forced to use violent means after decades of attempts to negotiate and protest non-violently were squashed. But when Kenya finally won independence years after the Mau Mau was ultimately defeated, it did so through bourgeois Kenyan politics, which ultimately only brought prosperity for well-to-do people in the country, as well as some aspirers to that class, and left the essential goals of the Mau Mau still unfulfilled. In the time since, Kenya's leaders have by and large allowed the country to be dominated by the economic interests of the West. The unpopular finance bill 2024 was justified, like its predecessors, on behalf of the country's economic restraints, especially its outstanding debts. So this behooves us to talk about where those debts come from. The International Monetary Fund, or IMF, was once described by the great anthropologist David Graeber as the high finance equivalent of the guys who come to break your legs. Established in 1945 as a section of the United Nations that offers loans to developing countries, the institution has spent decades loaning vast amounts to nations struggling economically, but in return has often imposed devastating interest rates and policy changes that have done nothing but further harm the poor and working classes of these countries. In the book Profiting Without Producing, Cole Lapovitsis tackles the subject of financialization, or the unprecedented expansion of financial activities, rapid growth of financial profits, permeation of economy and society by financial relations, and domination of economic policy by the concerns of the financial sector. The IMF and World Bank have been the entities primarily responsible for financializing developing countries, with the idea that massive loans and free market policy changes would allow for money to flow from rich countries to poor countries. Let's see how that worked out. For one, taking on loans backed by US dollars has led to developing countries everywhere taking on massive reserves of US public debt. As Lapovitsis writes, developing countries have been accumulating vast hordes of a form of money that rests solely on the promise of the US government to pay an intrinsically valueless dollar for every nominal dollar of its debt. 
This is why when the U.S. faces financial crises like that of 2008 or whatever the hell is about to happen now, the entire world is hit. It is part of why countries have become dependent on the U.S. economy to the point of sacrificing domestic economies. But the more infamous role the IMF has played, and the more direct way this manifests, is in structural adjustment policies. The demands that poor countries impose free market policies, cutting social safety nets for the poor, and opening up nationally organized industries to international finance. Such policies have been criticized heavily for years by people who care about helping the poor. A recent study finds that these programs undermine access to quality and affordable health care and adversely impact upon social determinants of health, such as income and food availability. Kenya, a young developing African country in the late 20th century, was a perfect victim of the U.S.'s global financialization. Sub-Saharan Africa, as Nicholas Ford writes for Jacobin, got approval for massive loans through following structural adjustment programs. Naturally, these programs mandated strict austerity and cuts to social spending, while reorienting economies to focus almost entirely on exports and extraction. For most countries, this meant investments into education and healthcare dried up, while cheaper exports to the West increased. The effects were devastating. Ford notes that in Sub-Saharan Africa, the number of people in poverty almost doubled from 1981 to 2001. Even in a period wherein wealthy Africans became richer, GDP per capita in Sub-Saharan Africa fell by 15% from 1980 to 1998. And by 2004, the continent was paying the wealthiest countries $15 billion every year in debt servicing. This is more than the continent received in aid, new loans, or investment. So much for the money flowing from rich countries to poor countries, the opposite was true, in fact. And Kenya was one such country. Slow at first to implement these structural adjustments, by the time Jaramogi Oginga Odinga and the Kenyan left had been viciously suppressed in the late 80s, Kenyan policy led to disaster. Under the rule of U.S.-backed strongman Daniel Arap Moy, Ford writes that, Poverty reduction also massively reversed, food prices went up, and hunger became rampant. At the start of the 1970s, around 35% of Kenyans lived in poverty. By the late 1990s, that number had shot up to more than half the population. According to the UN, the number of Kenyans living in poverty more than quadrupled from 3.7 million in 1973 to 17 million by 2003. Kenya's experiments with neoliberalism and SAPs could only be described as an abject failure. Only for elite Kenyans was their growth, with university-educated Kenyans seeing a threefold increase in incomes, while returns to secondary-educated Kenyans dropped by 50%. This disparity led to increased inequality, pushing Kenya into the top 10 most unequal countries globally. So, what did we learn in history class today? Out of British direct colonial rule, Kenya emerged still under the gun of a much more clever Western imperialism, one that dictates to you which elite will lead your country, forces said country to take on its debts, and rakes in profits as your country burns. As Kenya continues to take on massive IMF loans, as credit rating institutions evaluate the country's debt as increasingly toxic, as the unpayability of these loans prompt corrupt Kenyan leaders to tax the working class further and further, as prices of sugar, vegetables, and flour skyrocket, as 73% of Kenyans are either in severe financial distress or are failing to make ends meet, and as Kenya spends more money on servicing its debt than all other items in the national budget combined, it becomes clear that in Kenya, the past is still the present. So, as you learn about history, the narrative of a young generation rising up and changing everything for good becomes more and more appealing. For one, it centers on the masses, not a charming figurehead like a Kenyatta or an Odinga. It also signifies a challenge from the past, a significant contrast from the old heads and their destructive ways. And so the nation of Kenya has become compelled by the vision and determination of its generation Z. Gen Z is kind of hard to define. We know it generally to 
be the birth years between 1996 when I was born and 2010. So this is a generation that encompasses both young adults who are already part of the workforce ostensibly and people still in high school. And so what that describes more than anything is youth. Not something especially specific about Gen Z necessarily, especially inherently, but that young people across all these different age groups have been affected by this world in specific ways and are reacting to it in specific ways, having been given little other choice. Debunk Media published an emoji-filled editorial entitled A Love Letter to Gen Z with the following declaration. You and your generation have essentially crossed the Rubicon and are in fact heeding the timeless and universal clarion call by Franz Fanon, the Martinican psychiatrist, philosopher, and Marxist who insisted and is now beseeching you that each generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. Hmm. Decolonial literature. Still relevant in 2024. Who would have thought? Local news declares the demonstration's Gen Z protests. International reports from BBC and Al Jazeera also center the generation. But even though optimistic messages about young people can be inspirational and well-intentioned, it's worth noting that sometimes generational discourse misses the forest for the trees. Gen Z are not saviors. They make history under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. This website is full of proselytizing about generational comparisons. Some people's whole shtick is talking about how annoying Gen Z is, and some people like myself have had viral success merely pointing out Gen Z trauma. And my experience doing that video is that sometimes that can have its problems. Much of the response to my video took the statement that Gen Z is traumatized as a competitive declaration. Older people ask, what about my generation? This leads us to phenomena like whatever is ever going on on TikTok. Right now, it's this, this Gen X rise thing. Yeah, that thing. Generational discourse tends to avoid the actual conditions and context that surround the youth and instead take the youth as actors with intrinsic qualities, ultimately, sometimes unintentionally, providing a narrative that it is those intrinsic qualities of the kids these days that make them the way they are. But it, it doesn't work that way. We think generations make the world, but it's the world that makes generations. And it's never as simple as this generation has it tougher than the other. Gen X, are you listening Gen X? Are you okay, Gen X? Each generation has its challenges, and where there are many Gen Zers who are revolutionary and lefty in their sentiments, there are also going to be plenty of reactionary Gen Zers, as there have been with every generation. These things vary depending on class, background, culture, etc., etc. Kenya's Gen Z is quite different from the US's Gen Z. I guess this is all to say Gen Z is rising and is fighting an unjust world. But we must be careful not to think that this is because of their intrinsic specialness or out of them being better or worse than older or younger generations. We must be careful not to become overly individualistic or overly pessimistic or optimistic. We need to study the world around us, the legacies of science and history and theory left behind for us from these older generations and figure out strategically what we can do from our position to make things better, to apply what we know of the past to the present. This is what Fanon meant, I think, by saying each generation must discover its mission. In Kenya, Gen Z are rising up because the table has been set for them to do so. 50 years of Western-backed elites running the country with destructive policies and selfish motives are no longer tenable in the establishment because the hegemony they've relied on has weakened. The US is still the biggest world power, but its position is dwindling. It can no longer be seen as a reliable economic entity. It is constantly undergoing financial crises and sacrificing its underclasses in the process. We are no longer in the age of Moy. Ruto can't simply appeal to Western values and resources and expect that to quash dissent. Older elites like Ruto and Odinga no longer understand the value system of younger generations and how to appeal to them. They still think they can do what they've always done, promise dialogue and representation and satisfy the public. 
But younger generations are too downtrodden financially, too exposed to the realities of the world internationally, too savvy with regards to do-it-yourself digital media. Maybe one day these elites will figure out a new strategy in time for whatever's going to happen, and it'll work. For now, young generations have to take advantage of this radical sentiment. They must remember to never settle for individual success individuals being propped up as shiny new leaders, as well as minor reforms. They must work to continuously challenge the system, to turn it inside out, to build equitable systems to replace it. We must fight for a world beyond capitalism, beyond imperialism, beyond domination, for something far longer lasting than a single generation. Oh, that rhymed. Cool. If you like this video, consider subscribing to my Patreon. It really helps to keep this channel going. On there, we upload exclusive interviews with some of the coolest people around, including YouTubers like Noah Samson and Dr. Fatima. I think there's something else I have to say, but I forgot. So, thanks. <laughs>